the art presented a proposal, or sent out a proposal, I'm assuming a number of people put in, um, answered that proposal, uh, they wanted submissions rather, and we responded, a team of us, Josh Thorne, who's not here, Jane, myself, Henrik, and Sue. There were five of us involved on the curating side. So we'll talk, each of us will talk a little bit about what we did. But what we focused on when we, when we prepared our proposal was looked at the cave. What is it that's so remarkable and special about the cave? So we, you know, you know, this is the kind of thing we said in our proposal. We wish to explore the nuances of the cave through our objects and through the familiarity of texture and sounds. Using objects as a starting point, we wish to extract, discuss, and display the many particularities of the cave. We will show traces of our indigenous pasts as well as our global connections. We ask at what point foreign imports became local production. And we'll talk about that. We looked at local and imported. We will reflect processes such as communication and transportation, the legacies made through sea travel that marked the Cape as part of a network of ports. Okay, so that's what we tried to do. We looked beyond just objects and the ideas that inform the objects, the fact that the Cape is a port, that there have always been movements across it. We'll raise that as we go. We're starting with what the show looked like at the beginning, and some of the points that I've just raised will be made here. We looked at historical objects, and the historical objects were not actually borrowed or loaned. They become very difficult to loan and very expensive to borrow from institutions. So if you look at front, at the wire basket, thanks, you can see that the historical objects are represented through photographs, and they're juxtaposed with contemporary objects, so that the historical and the contemporary could be seen side by side. The cases on which the objects stand are quite interesting. They're designed to look like packing cases, crates. That's how objects were imported and transported, imported, exported from the, from the Cape as a seaport, as a seaport. So the notion informed every aspect of the display. We use the notion of islands. Um, that again talks to sea and movement. So you'll see that the islands of objects on the left-hand side, or left-hand side, and then towers of information on the right. Again, on those towers of information, we gave you historical documents. We then used, in the windows, we used um, photographs that were evocative of the cave. We chose seven photographs that in their own way recorded some kind of history. In front of you immediately is a view, a 17th century view of the Cape and the Western Cape. Then on immediately to its right is a painting, also from the 18th century, of, um, by Charles Bell, and it shows you a Mikey's hut. The next one is rock art. So they all in some way reference the Cape. Um, just a detail now of one of the towers. Um, it's a gable, it's from Stellenbosch, it's Bettelman House, I think, which is uh, 1799, from Stellenbosch. Bear in mind that we, one of the things we did do, and we did it again through Haneke, is we contacted all 28 local Western Cape museums and invited them to participate in some way, to send us some images that they wanted to include. We felt that even though the show was based in Cape Town, it represented the Cape in a wider sense. And we did that by including various objects or various images from the Western Province Museums. And this one, of course, we did with a photograph. What's interesting about this one, so can we go back, Jenna? Yeah. Now we can go back, now that you know that the gable, you know about the gables. I've just read about them and said it's probably one of the most famous styles of secular art. So it became very characteristic, there's lots and lots of debate about it. But please look in front of the photograph are a set of bookmarks. They're Michael Chandler's bookmark, book, bookends, sorry, bookends. And you can see that they're completely based on an evocation of Cape Dutch gables. So there's a direct parallel between old and new about how the old could be adapted to fit into the new. Oh, sorry, James just reminded me that even though 
what we're looking at here are not only settler influence, but the advantages of local craftsmen and the training of local craftsmen. These were not the white builders. These were craftsmen who were trained locally to do this kind of woodwork, to do the thatch work, to do the actual building of the windows. Now, I remember Raider telling me when we looked at the gables that it was often people from the East, Islamic people, who worked on the gables. And so, although we think these are Dutch gables, when you look at them next to a Dutch gable, they have a totally other influence. Yes, no, <laughs> Okay, just a detailed shot of the exhibition, and we look at some of these in detail. There were low tables as well, also like islands, and they dealt with specific themes that again related to the cave. And this one in front of you is about music. Just what are we looking at? And look at the design of the exhibition. We used raw wood, raw pine, look at the lights, it echoes the same kind of manufacture. So the kind of manufacture you saw in the crates exists in the table and the lights, and that was all very carefully considered. We we did the show in the world, in the stadium, as for those of you who saw it, and we were very influenced initially by the space. It's a big circular space, quite a difficult space to work in, and we were not allowed to touch a thing. We couldn't knock a nail in the wall, we couldn't alter the lighting, we couldn't do anything to the floor, so we had to bring everything with us. So that's how we did it, but we made full use of the space, means the, the photographs in the window that were made to scale. So this is a table of dealing with, with music, and we've got on the, on flat on the table is a photograph, which has been enlarged, it's a photograph of a painting done by Robert Gordon, those of you who know Robert Gordon, the early traveler to the Cape, one of the early documents that went back to Europe of what the Cape was like, and the people in the, in the painting are playing musical instruments, and some of those musical instruments are, are documented here, like the kelp horn in front. Also the Blicky's, the Blicky's guitar, but we'll talk, Jane will talk a bit about that. What's quite nice about this particular photograph, I bet in relation to the Freedom March in the, in, the, in the window behind, the first slave march, when slaves were freed in 1832, that's a painting of that. What, what I'm saying by this is that everybody in the Cape, all the peoples of the Cape, were included in the exhibition in some way or another. Um, remember when I read to you what we intended to do? We wanted to bring sound into the show. I'm not from Cape Town, I'm from Joburg. And one of the first things that hit me when I came to Cape Town was communal sound. The noonday gun, the, the sound of the ships in the harbour, the, I, I just at the moment I've gone a bit dry, but there are lots of communal sounds. So for me, Cape Town's a city about sound and communal sound. Johannesburg, you just hear sirens and cars and people talking, but you don't have sounds which communicate in the same way. So we're very keen to introduce sound, and this, the tall girl on the left, the blonde, is Jenna Birchall. She made a sound piece, and when you pull the strings of the sound piece, you would hear sounds of Cape Town. She went around and recorded sounds of Cape Town, so we tried to animate the exhibition in other ways, through sound and colour, and, and um, well, not so much music, but other ways of animating, which represented Cape Town. So we looked at other ways to represent. Point also to be made, and it's in the little folder, is it was a design as well. The artwork is also the design, and reflected on the design. I think you take it. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about selection. Um, we, we needed to work backwards and forwards because we had an idea of what old objects were in the museums in the Western Cape and started gathering images of those. But we needed to um, also have a, an idea of what contemporary objects were around. So um, the brief that had come from Haneke was that the show should be for a mixed audience. Um, that because it was at the stadium, it wouldn't only be designers that were coming to the show, but it would be families, young people, old people, mothers, grannies, and people from different cultures and backgrounds. So part of, within the selection, um, we thought 
we're not only going to be including what one might term high-end design, but looking at having a cross-section of very upmarket design businesses. Um, many people who are own them or work for them have had training overseas. And then also people who are self-taught, um, entrepreneurs who have started their own businesses selling what they make, and of course everyone in between. So there were 80 designers represented on the show as a whole, and um, we, I started sourcing, also looking at the CCDI database, also because I've done facilitation work for CCDI for many years, I had a good idea of who was out there and what work they were making. to show you exactly where we located and that the Cape has always been that crossover point between Europe, the East and itself. So it's kind of like the show explored those kind of options. Just showing you a picture of Cape Town as a port. Next one. Oh, ostrich shell. Ostrich shell is used a lot and goes back a long, long way in history. These are ostrich shells that are used as carriers or holders of water. The, the yoke is emptied out and a, a, a plug is made to, to, to fill the space. And they were made, the earliest that survived, because they're so fragile, they're back to 1936, I think, the earliest that survived. These are more recent, they come from Bushwans Kluwer in the near, near Clan William. And you can still see the desire to decorate something which is absolutely useful. But it also lays the groundwork for repurposing of objects. The material it's made, where material is used for one thing, or it's made, or it's born that way, but it can be repurposed to make something else. Uh, just a picture of a, uh, a Charles Bell from 1744, just to show that weaving is also local and indigenous to this part of the cave, and the pot you can look at. Um, this is a view of uh, from a runners up to the early 19th century of the. Cape Gardens, we, you know, Cape, the Cape was a, 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 a supply station between the Holland and Java, and this is the beginning of the, Cape, the gardens in Aranyazo, which have recently been resusc resuscitated. The original of this sits in Kirk wants to be toast down the road. Anything else? Let's go That's a detail of the liberation, the slavery liberation march. Notice the Union Jack. And the hats, the hats are some. This is the Krumak. There are a series of Krumaks that surround Cape Town as a kind of guide. This is the earliest, 1699. Sheikh Yusuf, and it's his in Makassar. It's in, kept in amazingly good condition, as you can see. It's a recent photograph. So we tried to bring in the cross currents of influence. This one, Corsa. Um, if you like, this is a Corsa beer basket from the Eastern Cape. It's pretty essential, although it's gone on for a while. Made from, it's woven, so you would think it, not, it would be waterproof, but it's made from a, a palm, I think it's a lala palm, and when liquid is put into the basket, it absorbs, so it becomes full, it becomes waterproof. Just look at the simplicity of the shape, and it's designed for its pure functionality, and the minimal decorative element that sits on the border of the basket. From here, we move into Jane. <laughs> So what we're going to do now is we're going to show an image of the older object or the artifact and then some images of the more contemporary objects that whose choice was inspired on the older object. This is a, a vessel made by Lisa Schalk. So it's made with cord and sewn together to create the shape, which in many ways is evocative of the, the Tlosa basket. Um, it's quite big, about that big. And this is a, a vessel made by Mara Fleischer out of a tire. So also looking then, um, bringing in the theme of repurposing or upcycling, that a tire can become a vessel. We were also in the show interested in collaboration and how you can mix mediums. So you have a ceramic vessel done by Sally Lowe and with a kind of embellishment done by um, Design Africa. 
and in many ways that uh, ceramic looks like ostrich shell. And then again, a collaboration. Um, we love this piece, found it humorous. It's called Made in China. So it's looking at the found object being the cheap, mass-produced Chinese plastic orange bowl and adding embellishment with weaving. And this is again one of the concepts from Mara. That's just to give an idea of how the vessels were displayed in the exhibition on the crates and with the big images behind. And you can see on the edge, on the sides of the crates, the images of the older objects. We also included furniture in the show, and these are the Zulu Mama chair, which I'm sure many of you know from Haldane Martin, with a, a stainless steel frame and a woven seat um, using a traditional Zulu basket weaving technique. And the combination of craft and high tech, I think Haldane was really one of the first designers to work in this way. Also providing employment through um, using handcrafted elements in a very upmarket, uh, what could one say, iconic piece. Um, I think he did this chair in about 2006 and it's still selling all over the world. Okay, the roots of pottery. This is a koi pot that's in the series Talk Rayers Museum. It's not as old, but it represents, about 100 years old, but it does, it represents a tradition which goes back hundreds of years. What is interesting about this pot is it's actually beautiful symmetry and that it's completely handmade. It's not made on a wheel, it was turned and rock and fired as you can see. It became a kind of symbolic image for me for much of the exhibition because pottery clay is one of those continuing forms. We've always had to make vessels, containers for liquid, and it's always been supplied by clay. I think it's a very fine example of a handmade pot. And intact as well. <laughs> so um, this is a, a vessel by Emiso Ceramics and Dile Dilvane. And we chose it because of the broken surface. So although his inspiration for this um, piece was actually scarifications of the skin, in many ways it looks like it's been broken into bits and then reassembled. This is a glass piece by Red Hot Glass. Um, their hand blow all their all their pieces and the colors and also the movement of the patterning on the glass uh, is evocative of smoke um, which links to the rock firing of the of the pot and this is a piece that was especially done for the show by Rizan Jockett uh, from Chic Fusion she normally works she works in felt and she normally makes scarves bags um, she had, she does make some vessels, but for this vessel she looked at the shape of a koi pot and translated it into felt. Sometimes the ostrich shells break. And these are short, ostrich shell shards, they've been much enlarged, but ostrich shell beads also date from way back. Quite a simple technology where the broken pieces were put into a groove and they were rolled all to make the same shape. And they created jewelry and marking. Jewelry, one of those, if you go back all the way to Blumbos, they are necklaces, shell necklaces. So decorating the body is as old perhaps as the sense of ourselves as human beings because Blombos is the first place that we find a decorated piece of ochre. But this shows the use of ochre, uh, the use of shell, the reuse of shell, and in fact the notion, the way, the notion of decorating the body. Um, so here we included pieces by Avuva. Uh, they're based in Prince Albert, which is a very ostrich, I don't want to use the word, infested area of the Western Cape. Um, and they make bigger pieces using ostrich shell. Um, and jewellery. And here this bowl they've combined, I 
think it is a um, aluminium, I'm not sure, with the ostrich eggshell. Um, they also do furniture pieces. There was a very nice table where they'd used the ostrich, el ostrich eggshell as mosaic on the top of the table. This piece is made by a group in Stellenbosch um, called Kaim Nandi and it's the Missy Baba. They make beautiful bags. I'm sure many of you know them. It's their offcuts, the leather offcuts. So they realized the leather offcuts could be made into something and assisted this group to use them to make necklaces. We also like the way that they look like ostrich shell. Uh, this is Kelly Doran. She's also working with um, repurposing, upcycling found uh, materials. You can see the earrings of old coins and the ring and the pendant are the tops of um, beer bottles. Okay, imported ceramics from the East. And a major influence, I think, on the, in, the Cape, in the Western Cape. And it's one of those questions which we raised in our proposal. At what point does the import become local? I'll raise that question again later. But this is a VOC plate. It dates to the end of the 17th century, made in China and imported here. The VOC plates, the blue and white, has become very popular in, 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 in contemporary production. This one sits in Palm Museum. And I'm sure all of you have picked up shards. These shards are actually picked up at the Fruit and Veg parking lot. If you're looking for shards, there's a guy there who collects them and he'll sell them to you at a reasonable price. <laughs> but uh, this is a, a pendant by Michael Chandler where he's used a very recognizable uh, broken piece of ceramic and added silver to create a pendant. So here we've got a few ceramicists working with using the plate uh, for decoration. This is Helen Vaughan with a very recognizable Table Mountain Protea C depiction. And Lisa Ringwood, um, where she's combined the Delft, which is an influence from the East, with the Fangos, which is very much from the Western Cape. This is from Zizabele Ceramics in uh, Fishhook. It's called the Bambanani Bowl. Um, so they've added, they've created a more 3D uh, with the figures around the edge of the bowl, but the patterning is very much uh, like the shui shui cloth. Okay, talking about Eastern Cape influence in the Cape again, this is just a context photograph for the next the chair. It's a Kosa man dressed in his ceremonial gear, about to go to a party or a wedding or some kind of ceremony. The white and black is very characteristic of certain groupings in certain regions of the Eastern Cape. But it's come, it's been a kind of major influence here in the, here in the city. And this is a, a furniture piece done by Casamento called The Promise. You can see she has um, reinterpreted the closer traditional dress into a furniture piece. So what I found really interesting with this piece, and it was tested at the exhibition, is that although she's working with very distinctive uh, patterning, not from her own culture, she did it in a sensitive and respectful way. That at the show, at the stadium, uh, where you get a variety of people moving through there, including security guards, cleaners, and so on, people really responded and loved this piece. And that's the back of the couch, which she's exposed um, the structure. Okay, can't do a show on Africa without beads. But the important point to make about beads is that every glass bead is imported. Every safety pin was imported. So what we're looking at here is imported items being made our own in some kind of way through the making. So what these are, Jane and I argue, conventionally called love letters, but they're little panels stuck onto a safety pin which can then get attached to a garment. 
What's happened with these letters, they've become kind of used for advertising, such as the South African flag, the anti apartheid one on top with the on the yellow, or more popularly now, used often for AIDS promotions of some kind. But I think you could look at them and you could identify yourself, the old and the new. So now we're just going to look at beading used in slightly different ways. This is a very big platter dish made by a bishop from master wire and bead crafts. Um, amazing craftsmanship. Um, he also does mirrors and a variety of, of other products. And this is a, a beaded stamp. Uh, some of you might remember this stamp, I don't know what year it was, but I do remember it. Um, done by Tamlin Blake on the loom. So it's quite big, it's probably about 30 centimeters by 20 centimeters. So here we look at beading taken into artwork. And a beaded stool by Streetwires, where they've used a bigger bead. Looks like you could almost get a massage when you sit on that stool. Okay, chairs. This is a Hernan Dahl chair, also probably early 19th century, that's about 200 years ago, and very characteristic of the cave with the rippy, the rippy seat. And there are some stinkwood and some other local woods. Very much desi designed with Hernan Dahl and toolbox, these chairs are quite characteristic of those times and very characteristic of the cave, although the influence for them is probably Dutch. And this is a chair called the Magnet Chair by Fuerkel, where they've used a, a, it follows on with the Rimpy idea, but the, it's not, the seat is not leather, it's made out of a cord or a rope, and the, the frame of the chair has become more contemporary. You'll see quite a lot of local furniture designers playing with the idea of Rimpy. Okay, this is the very famous orange and dress from Stellenbosch Museum and we were allowed to dress up one of the guys in, in the dress. It dates from 1745 and was imported into the country, but it's more or less intact. We show it because it's the source for some other later work, which is the, the patchwork quilts and patchwork pieces, which exist in a lot of the, a lot of the museums. And you can go to the next one. So this is a, a, pad, a quilt that Hartworks made using their own offcuts. So it's probably, it's big enough for a double bed, um, but they used the opportunity of the show to assemble all the bits that were lying around the workshop. Similarly with sewing, this is a sonder, again from Stellenbosch or Swellen Dam, I'm not 100% sure, just to show the amount of sewing skills that are available and sewing that is still obviously going on today. And I think if you're not persuaded by now that the old influenced the new, I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, a, this is a teddy from Heartworks. I'm sure you all know the, the teddies and the monkeys they make. So again, the teddy bear, very British uh, friend but here with a reinterpretation with embroidery and each one is unique, colorful and, and bright and friendly. So they work as a group on the bits. So someone, someone might make the body and someone else might make the arms and then it gets sewn together. So we were also looking at uh, environmental influences, where we live, the nature, how it affects us, the weather, so the sea, Cape Town being at, or the Western Cape being at the meeting point of two enormous oceans. These are porcelain vessels by Lisa Ferrer. She calls them the fluidity vases. And then as a port, and as a port, Cape Town as a port, knots, you'll find a lot of fishermen are really good crafters. Um, and Pichelik, who are using rope, this is not a great example of their work, but picking up the idea of rope um, and, and thread and making jewellery, which is also doing extremely well all over the world. Also looking at what gets washed up on the shore, this is Don Samuels, he lives in Feldriff, he's a keen bird watcher, and he also collects 
wood that's washed up on the beach. Um, these are the, I think they're called sandalings, those little birds that run on the shore. Um, and creating a piece that maybe has no particular function other than to make you smile, feel good, decorate. And this is a group from Masipumelele. Um, Jan Diswa is still using pl the plastic waste to create products. Initially they started off as a group that was cleaning Komaki Beach and then realized that there was an opportunity to make something out of what was picked off the beach. Kists are very sort of uh, a way of moving your stuff when you travel by a shop and the a lot of the collections are full of wooden kists. Um, they're very finely made as you can see and they're often got brass ornaments with them. Um, we put it in because it's a source for another body of work. Um, I just want to say we th this talk is taking longer than we thought because Henrique is still going to speak as well. Is everybody um, okay if we go over time, about 15 minutes or so? So this is a piece done by Recreate. Um, she uses suitcases and sometimes trunks to create small couches or seats. And the fabric is actually from my textile business, Fabric Nation. It's a map of Cape Town. The patterning is the street map of Cape Town. So also again the idea of repurposing, looking at how a trunk can become a seat. And I must say, I don't know if it's a good thing, but at the exhibition a lot of people were inspired by this piece. They said, I have a trunk on top of my cupboard, now I know what to do with it. Part of the, again, a porcelain piece from the East. This is Imari, it's Japanese, probably late 17th century. I'm hard for me to date them, but we have two very similar pieces. One, so late 17th, one early 19th century. But highly decorative, very beautiful. Compared to the koi pot you looked at a little while ago, this is turned on a potter's wheel, very sophisticated glazing, but the notion of vessel, the notion of that shape as a holding form still persists. So here we just have a shot of some of the vessels we included related to the Mari bars. Um, you have a piece by uh, Lisa Ringwood with the baobab on it. Um, then those, you see those flu fluidity vases again. And then a piece by Serpentine, a beaded, it's called the large plum vase. Um, so it, the shape relates to a, a Chinese vase. And then some pieces by Clementina van der Waals. Okay, and then also Fame Boss, our beautiful, beautiful Fame Boss. I seem to love it more and more. <laughs> and these are proteas, they're made out of cardboard by um, a business called Kriasi. Incredible crafting to, to, to make them. And again, vessels by Lisa Fira, where she's used, I think she uses actual fables to stamp on or emboss, I'm not exactly sure. Nick Bladen, who uses a wax, lost wax casting technique. Uh, and this is the cake table by Gregor Jenkins, made out of steel. Um, I, I was looking on his website and he, he writes about himself as an engineer. So I thought that was really interesting, the way that he's working in constructing these pieces. Um, a, a, a wire basket used for making raisins. This one's from Worcester. And this is a piece by Willow from Feeling Africa. I'm sure you all know it. Uh, he was part of a CCDI program with Aid to Artisans in 2004, right? 2005, maybe. Um, so how he wire work has always been very popular, but how he made it new was by electroplating the wire and putting color onto the wire. And I think this is also really an iconic piece. It's still sold all over the world. You get bigger ones, smaller ones, and different colors. This piece we put in with the idea that there would be a very mixed audience. We wanted to encourage people to not feel that they were not designers, that people um, 
do have we do have a kind of a design thinking built into us. So this is made by a group of kids in Mfuleni. They needed something to play with, drive around with in. Um, so they looked around their neighborhood, found what they needed, a crate, some wheels from the black bin, a metal rod from a stake, a plot stake, a piece of electrical cord, and with the help of a local artist, um, created this push cart, which they could then use to play. Um, it's on an axle, so you can steer it if someone pushes you from behind. And then they also used it to help people take their grocery ho groceries home. So it was great to have this at the show, because a lot of people walked past and said, I made one of those. And in that way, it was opening up the concept of design. Those are the kids who made it. Then we also looked at recycling, upcycling, repurposing. That idea that you use what you can find to make what you need. This is a light by Heath Nash. A flower bucket by David Clark Brown. He trained as a dentist and he uses dentist tools to, to cut into the plastic. A uh, bottle top basket by Fanny Manguero. Bags made out of recycled banners. Bags made out of recycled grain bags. Walanani using branding. And we also had that theme of branding going through the show from the VOC on the plate. I see Nikoli Swanapult here with the, with the car head piece with the VOC branding on it to how people are using branding and making it their own. You find Coca-Cola all over the world and I think it's fantastic the way people then use Coca-Cola to create a variety of products and objects. This is um, by XYZ. It's a football that's been repurposed as a light. So when children, during the day, children play with the football, and it col collects kinetic energy. And at night, when the light gets plugged into the socket, they can study with the same object that they're playing with. So really very clever thinking. Uh, this is the last slide. We included the big image of Madiba in what we think of as the African shirt. But in fact, the fabric for, the, for his shirts came from the East. It's a silk batik. And the style of the shirt is a European shirt and tie. So we used it, um, Madiba, as a style icon and also to show the mixture of influences, the East, the West, Africa. And the other reason we included was that post at 94, um, Madiba encouraged everyone to make it new. So to look at, to try to reinvent how we live, how we interact with other people, what we, what we make, and in that way to create a new society. 21 years later, I'm not sure how well we're doing, but not to end on the negative. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, then, yeah. So now, basically, the exhibition was divided into two sections. The section we've shown you now was about heritage and the influence of, of heritage on contemporary handcrafted products. And Henrik and Sue Heathcock put together a, a section we can call Beautiful Spaces. We, I actually we had this sort of more modern kind of uh, background drawn um, and that sort of contextualized everything. Um, with the, the pictures from Lucinda Mudge on ceramics, with the brass bits, um, the terrariums, the, it was just to show the more formal side of what's going on but still having the strong influence from our Cape past. And then going on more to the blue and white, which was very much the harbour, the trade routes and ceramics, and 
handmade and, and just that whole combination of how do we actually make it look nice together. We see all these things, but how can we actually put them in our everyday lifestyle? Because people are, like, we're quite surprised that every single object of here was made and found in the Western Cape. And even this floor is Corcolium flooring, which comes from Somerset West, which is a, it was first developed for AECI's factory floors, and it's wood chips mixed with, glass, uh, with glue. And it's, it's non-sparking, so that's the first time that they actually used it, now it's used all over. And um, the other influences for the exhibition were looking at obviously the vegetation. So you can see the wine display is very green. So everybody living here is obviously influenced by our mountain and what's around us. And speaking to designers, often they would talk about growing up in a certain area or pieces of furniture in their house that, does, that influence their own design. So we broke it up into the post-colonial lounge, um, the blue and white trade fruits, which was all the ceramics, and then the vegetation green area, which was just to show all of the very natural influences that people have, organic shapes, um, just influences with those colors. And then finally, the other area that I worked on was the um, industrial, I, I, I sort of called my industrial woodstock kind of feeling, um, young artist kind of space, like a, a studio space. So that was a lot of industrial, black and white, doodling, all of those things. So you can see all the cross-cultural references. And for me, the most important thing is that when I look at an interior, I don't particularly want to know um, exactly where everything comes from. I just want to know that when I look closely, it does tell a story, but as a whole, you can feel more. If I have just a plain white bowl and I look at it um, a bit closer, I can feel, well, that is based on another shape or it just has a bit extra. So for me, the point was really for everything to shine together and not one thing to overshadow the other thing. So all of them had the same platform and they had the same sort of sort of influence in a way, but they all looked so amazing together. They helped each other look even better than they were. Um, sorry, that doesn't mean to be a bad comment, but it's just showing they helped each other show off the beauty. And they also emphasized materials like that. Emphasize, emphasizing the green, the bamboo, Patricia Bray's beautiful lush green leaves turned into a wallpaper. Um, driftwood connected. Um, the orchids from Okasi, um, John Vogel's chair at the top, um, Robin Sprong's wallpaper. So it's all just, everything works so well together, but it doesn't, it, it's not necessarily about each piece. For me, it wasn't about each piece, it was how they work together. So there is, but I think the important thing there was the common language between each section. Um, the next thing I'd like to say is that I, I, I think that the objects themselves um, also chose themselves in a way because the, you, you could just by looking at them tell where they would fit in because a lot of the designers, I hadn't even seen what they were sending me before, I just knew their work and when I unpacked I could just go this section, that section, you could just see where it would go. I, I know I've been asked to talk about trains. Um, for me, I, I think that trains are something that get repeated time and again. So right at the moment, blue and white in the sense of like Mali, Batik might be very fashionable, but a few years ago it might have been Delft. Or a few years before that, maybe coastal blues. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that things always reinvent themselves. So actually, looking at our past and which designs were, where we started is actually very important because you can never go wrong by looking back and then bringing it forward. And technology is the only thing that's changed there. So although blue and white might have been what we started off with here in the Cape, 
the fact that we now have so many other things to help us lift it to a different level is amazing. And I think that, for me, knowledge is power. So the more you can actually know what's going on around the world, look at what other people are doing, that is the best way to, you just naturally then have a look at something and you would know, like black and white might be a timeless kind of trend, but the different materials that are in trend at the moment, or the different patterns that are in trend at the moment, are the ones that then you'd see more at the moment. So your eye automatically just adjusts. You would, if you look at a lot of things, you automatically will look and think, wow, that's amazing, I've been seeing that a lot at the moment and it would just influence you in that way. But I, I'm not such a big person on trends for everything. I just think it is very important to know where things came from and have a look at everything because that's the only way you can really decide what you do like and what you'd like to do. And the last thing I'd like to say is that I, for me, one thing I heard long ago, which I always remember, is, uh, it's just a thought for the day, is that the biggest enemy of an idea is the idea itself. And that is such a true thing. If you think of the innocence of a child drawing something, they don't actually judge themselves on that drawing. Um, they can just move on to something else in two minutes, where a lot of us get so caught up in what we're trying to do that we actually get stuck. So for me, I think explore and just be yourself and don't judge yourself. Thank you.